All right, and welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, Rio 2, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, for more information, just visit the website, Pasnia, P-A-Z-N-I-A dot com, or uh, I guess just today, just keep listening. Uh, a number of months back, I came across an individual who goes by the name uh, Rex. Uh, he joined the Pasnia Committee of Correspondence, uh, gave an introduction, and uh, usually from those, I can tell if someone is serious or not. Uh, my initial leaning was yes, and uh, after finally speaking to him uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, so uh, he'll give us a story, uh, but it sounds like we both started on a path towards, uh, towards liberation um, years ago. Uh, but at some point we realized that some community uh, or network was, ne uh, was a necessity, uh, something bigger perhaps. And uh, since then we've been uh, trying to work out the logistics on uh, making that happen. Uh, my focuses have really been health, uh, high-quality animal products, uh, building up the homestead here at Veritas, and uh, networking and building out this parallel society, among you know other things too. But uh, it appears his have been uh, on slightly different areas, uh, you know, some you know legal and things like that, um, which uh, I know like uh, which is uh, which is why I know this and our coming brainstorming sessions are going to be top-notch. And uh, as for networking, another valuable connection, a uh, valuable diplomatic relation, uh, if I may put it that way. Uh, so today I figure we'll go into his uh, background. Uh, he can lay out his vision for what he's building. Uh, we'll talk about uh, where our visions overlap and uh, you know how we can work together and, and uh, helping him you know, bring that bring those to fruition. Uh, we'll go deeper into uh, you know maybe an element or two of the second realm today um, that he's put a lot of thought into. But uh, I do think uh, we were just talking uh, before the show, and and I really think that uh, you know this first this first episode might be best as like an introduction, more more of uh, um, to, to what he's doing and where our, our visions overlap. And then uh, in future episodes, we can really dive deep into, um, you know, things like uh, uh, like maybe second realm security or, or uh, uh, security or th things like that, um, you know, more individual elements and just go really deep into the brain brainstorming stuff. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And uh, I know you guys are going to enjoy this, too. But uh, without further ado, Rex, um, welcome uh, back. Welcome to welcome. Uh, welcome back. But uh, welcome to the Vani podcast. Uh, how are you today? Thank you so much. I'm doing wonderful today. Um, so, yeah, I want to just start with instead of doing all my background, I'm sure I'm going to get to that, but mm -hmm. I feel like the way to start today is to explain the question that got me um, to where I'm at right now. So meditation and things happened for years before this in terms of um, me just putting my energy toward finding out what the right question was to ask. But, but the, the question basically is this, if you have a world where everyone is a trillionaire or everyone has all of their ma basic needs met, like, in fact, maybe everything you could ever want, it's a world when you, when you have that world, that's kind of hard to, for people to imagine, but um, we can talk a little bit um, later on about what the implications of that type of a world are. But when you have that world, what is needed? It's that's that's the question that got me uh, directed toward community as a need that money doesn't necessarily solve and abundance of material uh, uh, wealth doesn't doesn't always help. Actually, um, it turns out for me when I have an abundance of material wealth, I end up leaning toward uh, my comfort zone. And uh, also, if I don't need to speak with people, sometimes I don't speak with people. And uh, if I don't need to socialize, which is, th these are these are inherent parts of having a, a good community. And as it turns out, sometimes you get really rich, but then you're miserable because what you had when you were a slave was a bunch of people to sing songs with that you got to see every day and you cared about each other because you kind of had to. Once you get rich, you could say, not that I'm rich, but I, I moved my awareness to that world to, to try and solve problems for that world, given that I believe it's a probable world for many of us. So that's the, that's the, the basic question was, hey, if everyone has everything they could ever want for, what do they want? Like by definition, they don't want anything. But aside from definitions, bring yourself, bring your mind to that world and say, solve every problem you can think about solving with technology and an abundance of money, and then see what problems still exist. And the, that's, that's where I headed and uh, placed my awareness for quite uh, some time. 
just to kind of look around that world and see what's needed. Um, and I came to now what I'm working on now. So, so that's what I'm working on. That's the, that's the seed. That's the, the intention. That's the question that created the seed almost honestly, mm -hmm. like the intention yeah. kind of comes from the God and then the, then the, uh, the ideas start coming in, in man's mind. And then once the idea is for, formulated well enough, then man tries to bring it to the physical realm instead of just in his mind. So, um, yeah, what, what I ended up building in my mind after that, that intention is, is tied to uh, community that as a whole community, as the concept, the essence, the, uh, the experience of having neighbors that, you know, that you trust, that you interact with, that you enjoy interacting with, um, something we don't have a whole lot of, honestly, mm -hmm. <laughs> in many parts of the world today. Yeah. Yeah, most certainly. Most certainly. And, um, uh, yeah, so I guess to, to give you a little, just to, to, to share this with you and kind of, cause I, I can't, I, I came to a similar conclusion. I, I, I came to, you know, the, the, these free ideas in 2015. And then I went to my, my first freedom festival, Midwest Peace Liberty Fest, um, back in 2015. That was just like a weekend event. Um, but I'd never, you know, I'd never been around people, um, you know, that many people, like-minded people who, um, you know, I wanted to be around. It was different than, you know, hanging out with friends or family. Like these are, you know, people that like, you, you didn't necessarily know them personally, but like we all, we were all connected, you know, very, very deeply, even though we really didn't know each other. Um, so like that's, uh, that was something I, I guess, um, that was kind of, the, I guess, maybe the seed for, um, for Pasnia was, um, I guess, experiencing that, experiencing the second realm is, I, I guess that's the verbiage that I used to describe it. Um, it's, uh, it's a lot different um, than, you know, interactions in the survival society today, um, you know, where it's, you know, disempowering and, you know, de-autonomizing um, per se. Um, so, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, that really is the next step. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you, you have your individual liberation, you have your health, you, you have your, um, you know, you have a clear mind and then it just seems like, uh, that the next step is, yeah, that, that's, that's what the, uh, it's, it looked like for me too. So, um, yeah, I'm with you for sure. Yeah. Cool. I think, I think that many of us haven't come to that conclusion and it took me years, honestly, of, um, I mean, I got myself, I got to a point where I thought I have enough money to survive. You know, I've got 10 years worth of expenses saved up. I, sh I need to stop pursuing money and start and, and really stop really and consider what do I want to do? Because ethically I had seen, uh, believed and maybe still somewhat do believe that if your goal is to earn money and you don't have a solid stopping point, then you just start earning more and more and more. Right. And as you become more and more of a giant with respect to money, it, it appears or it appears that appeared at least that you end up squashing people below you in a sense. Like you end up stepping on ants that you didn't intend to step on. And the only reason you're stepping on them is because you no longer care or because you're just so big that you've saved up so much money and, or you've uh, found ways you've, created systems where you can just suck money from the economy. And sometimes that money is attached to other people's value, their time and their energy and their work, those types of things, their efforts. And when you're taking, to me, it's unethical to take, I mean, not on a grand scheme, on a grand scheme, you know, being the God and looking down at the, the entire universe and saying, you know, I want to experience slavery and I consent to do that to myself. So then my higher self says, hey, go down there, be a slave. You know, I, don't, I have no objection to slavery on those terms. But for me, where I am now, I have objection a little bit to not even objection. It's just like I've experienced this enough. I want to do something else. I want to do some I want to build a heaven, really, honestly. I want to build heaven so that I can go there because I think that's the I think that's the proper way to get to heaven. <laughs> you got to build it. Um, and back to money, basically, if mm -hmm. I'm sucking money out of the economy, well, it depends where that money came from. But if that money's blood money, or that money is attached to someone's labor, and I suck 1000 hours worth of their labor, and it takes me 30 minutes to do it. And I do this on a continuous basis. I feel like I'm the slave master at that point, even if I just, you know, figured out capitalism, and I won, you know, it still is like the capitalistic system is a slave system. 
or we, whatever system you want to call it. The slave system is a slave system. And uh, money is one of those tools of enslavement where brilliantly all they have to do is adjust some knobs on the, on the interest rates or the money supply and they can immediately, I mean, there's a little bit of lag, but basically they can take as much energy from the slave masses as they wish. You know, they need mm -hmm. more, they need more workers to come and apply for jobs. What do they do? Just crank that number a little bit. Now all of a sudden everyone needs more money on a general scale and you get more people applying for your jobs. So you could, with this system, it, it may be that 90% of the work done and the effort we place into the economy doesn't come back to us. It just goes to building military bases or doing unnecessary things. The uh, essential workers, the non-essential workers, 90% of the hours worked, maybe more. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think Michael Tellinger from the One Small Town his, I don't know what his math was, but his math is this. Three hours per week gets you everything you need to survive. So that's a little bit, you know, that's what 93% of the hours that you've been working, if you were only working 40 hours a week, are unnecessary, honestly, for, uh, for what we could create for ourselves to have all that we mm -hmm. need, healthy food, health itself, being healthy, um, having a place to live that's comfortable. Um, the only thing that in his, in his focus, Michael Tellinger has, has built a world in his mind and, and it's coming into the physical reality now too. Um, I think that he has missed community as a core component, even though all of his solutions will benefit community. But I think it's not been his focus as community. And I think that's something that I, that I add, you know, it's like the value of meditating on something for five years and then finally coming to an answer or a solution. I think there's some value in it. And I think that's where it is. I think knowing that it's important for rich people, which I hope all of us will be rich in the sense that I, I don't love that word, the connotations with it, but in the sense that we, we don't want for our physical needs. Mm -hmm. But once you don't want for your physical needs and you're free to do anything you wish, you might spend a little time for a while spending all your money, going on all the rides, doing everything, exploring and traveling. But at some point, pretty soon, as a free man or woman, it starts to matter who you're spending your time with. And how are you going to find the right people to spend your time with? You can meditate and attract them to you. Valid. But if you want to do it on a large scale for multiple people, that's what I'm trying to do so that so that I can solve this uh, issue for more than just myself. And I feel like when you solve it for a lot more people at, at a time, then you get a better quality result than if you just solve it for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Kind so of the network effect. I think it's called Metcalf Law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you hit on a, a couple of really important things there, and that's uh, things that I realized, um, things that I realized. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, back, I mentioned back in 2015, well, like the first the first rabbit hole I, re I really went down was Austrian economics, which is, you know, more of the free market variety of that. Um, so yeah, I, I, you're totally right that it seems like in, the, in this realm, um, like money is the energetic controller, um, like it is the way that, um, yeah, it's, it's the way that, uh, you know, our, our time here is, is allocated um, in this sense is, is, is basically money, right? You know, that, that's the phrase, time is money. Um, like it's that it's that deep like it's it's yeah it's it's that that's a that's a um that pervasive but um yeah yeah and, and i guess another thing i realized was after i after i finally quit i guess it was back in 2018 so i've worked a survival society, survival society job and coming up like four or five years but um i noticed that like um when i started working at home like doing stuff for myself i could get done in like what would take like six or eight hours uh, like I guess it would be like a full work day. I can get like full work day done in like two or three hours and I can be, I can have like a lot more done than what I got in, you know, full day of, of, of survival society work. So, um, I, yeah, I, I totally, uh, you know, from experience I can, and, and I've, I've seen other people, you know, with the same, the same observations that there's so much time I know, like working in survival, survival jobs where I wasn't really doing anything. Like there was no reason for me to be there. I was just getting paid to, you know, do nothing and just waste my time where like it was where, where my time and attention couldn't go somewhere else, but it couldn't be on anything. Like that's almost worse, right? Where it's, where it's, I don't know. It's just like, idle like idleness um like an idle life but uh yeah and to me i see 
I see so many of the hours that are worked. Let's say someone has a job and their job is ultimately unnecessary, the entirety of it. Like certain cases that lawyers take on, completely a waste of a case, a waste of hours. And the only reason they do it is for some desire to have money. And it turns out that Mm -hmm. by going down that route, you make money. But at the same time, in your home, if you're a, if you're the dad and mom and you've got 10 children and one of them just starts doing something retarded that doesn't actually help the whole of the family, you kind of try and get them to stop it. Assuming you allow them to enough freedom to learn their lesson, but at the same time, there is no net benefit. And there's so much time that we spend doing things. And sometimes the most profitable businesses are the counterintuitive ones, like robbing and stealing don't make a whole lot of sense in terms of in an, in a one family, right? You don't steal from each other in your right. family. In fact, yeah. you don't even have to tell each other to pay for the food in the, in the cupboard. Like you don't even have to keep track of that shit. Cause you're like, well, they're not going to eat more than they're hungry for. Right. But you also don't expect them to take that food out of your cabinet and go and give it to the neighbor or worse, sell it to the neighbor. Right. So because it's an enclosed environment, you kind of, you get a lot of benefits from not having to keep track of everything. And then there's things that make absolutely no sense. But since we have our awareness kind of so uh, fragmented, the God has his awareness so fragmented in all these different ways to have this experience that we're calling, you know, earth, life, whatever. Then we see stuff that's counterintuitive. And sometimes it's most profitable to do it that way, to just do something that, people would, it wouldn't make sense to anyone. They're like, why are you doing that to make money? Well, because it makes a lot of money. Yeah, but why are you doing that? <laughs> like, you're not helping anyone. Well, I'm making money. This happens. This happens in, in our, the money system we have today and the economy that we have today. And I just want to step away from it because I understand that it's, it might have its benefits for us to come to a world like this, like, like, servile society um, and look around and see what it's like and even experience it. Then at some point we may choose to not experience it anymore. And I don't think it's that hard to move away from this world of servile society. In fact, like Michael Tollinger is showing, it's only like three hours a week. And like you've said, it's a lot, it's a lot less, but a lot of us aren't taking care of our own needs without money. We're taking care of our needs with uh, by doing something, acquiring money, taking money for it, and then spending that money. And I'm just super uh, a proponent. I, I just really don't want to have an open um, what's it what's it called? There in in like chemistry they call it a closed system where you're not letting energy in or out. There's like a membrane like around a the system, system, and yeah. you're like, okay, whatever happens in here. It's contained. It's not, we're not taking from the outside and we're not giving off to the outside. No heat, no chemicals, nothing. That's kind of where I want to, I want to take a closed system and make it into heaven. I don't want to just say, Hey, if I, if I figure out how to have slaves, then I can have a pretty nice house and a pretty nice life. It's like true, (laughs) but guess what? I think the God, I think the system that the God has created is a contained closed system, which means you can spend a few lifetimes as a rich bastard. You're probably going to also spend a few lifetimes as the slave of the rich bastard to a point that you're going to eventually no longer like this world. You're going to say, you know what? The world of slavery, even if you're the slave master, kind of isn't worth it because if I'm going to be a slave master of a thousand slaves during one lifetime, I got to live a thousand lifetimes of being a slave. And it wasn't that fun. It was cool. It was a great idea. We tried it and we enjoyed it while it happened, but we're done now. As far as my soul is like, I'd, I'd like to build something where, where we don't have to include slavery in order to survive or financial transactions with others that are enslaving, mm-hmm. which means being careful about what money you take and what time and energy you take. Because some of that, it's a loose term, blood money but it's blood time and blood energy and all that. It's just the, it's the results. It's the fruit of someone that was not consenting 
on some level. On some level, they're consenting because to me, everyone's higher self is consenting to everything they experience. So I think all of life personally is consensual on some level. But we also get to choose how much of this life and the world that we build includes slavery, consensual or not. We can kind of say, let's not have it. And slavery by any other name is still slavery to me because a duck by any other name is still a duck. The substance of slavery still exists. Because people still have to work to live. And they're not enslaving themselves to nature, which is kind of acceptable, right? Being God's slave is acceptable. You know, you have to work or you can't live. In pure nature, natural law, fine. But when it comes to some other person that's your equal enslaving you, then it's a little bit uglier. <laughs> and uh, society has has frequently acknowledged that it's pretty ugly. They just kind of say, all right, we're not doing this anymore, and everyone has a heyday about not having slavery anymore, then they go back to work, and they just change the name of slavery to something else. Call it capitalism. Call it something. And then it just happens again. <laughs> so yeah. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not endeavoring to get rid of slavery from all universes. I just want it out of my world because I want to like build a world that, that I feel comfortable with and happy to, happy to contribute with. Yeah, well said. Yeah, no, that's that's uh um yeah, I share a lot of, a lot of the same sentiments. Yeah, for sure. And that's um that's kind of, you know, where the the second realm philosophy is at too. You know, there's the first realm which is the survival society and then there's the second realm um, you know, pockets of freedom essentially. Um and uh you know, like it's not about uh you know, fighting like I, for a while like I you know, the the goal was, to, you know, like a an anarchist society, right? Like uh that was the goal for a while, you know, free society, but um but uh now it's like uh that doesn't really seem, you know, um, if it, it may be plausible um, in the future, but the only way it's going to be plausible is if, um, you know, if the, if these places actually get built um, and, you know, like that work is actually done. Um, so regardless of what our current situation is, um, like the and, and, and also too like in my lifetime, like in this lifetime, you know, in this incarnation, I would like to, to have a little more freedom, you know. So um, it's, it's up to me to build that life that I that I that I, that I want. So, um, yeah, it sounds like we're yeah, we're we're uh, resonating on all fronts, per se. Yeah, that's cool. You brought up two things that might might we might go deeper into in other in other podcasts. But uh, you said building it out, like building. I'm I'm gonna put words in your mouth, but building infrastructure mm -hmm. for the your what you call the second realm mm -hmm. to exist, which is basically the other world that we want to create while not trying to undermine or defeat or fight with the first the other like the main matrix right because shutting down the matrix is like you walk in a room with 30 people they're all sleeping they're at different sleep cycles some of them are ready to wake up but you don't want to just blast a horn and wake everyone up when even if what they are experiencing is a nightmare personally i think it's not right to wake somebody before their time mm -hmm. and that's just that, i'm sure there's a lot of people that dispute that but my only my only thing where I think they would agree with me is you got to follow whatever your your intuition your god your your higher self whatever whatever it is where your heart tells you what to do you got to follow that so whether mm -hmm. that says to do something that is regular or completely normally wrong if your heart's telling you to do it I'm kind of like for it even if it's like hey my heart told me to kill you and I'm just like well I might defend myself from you, but in terms of my higher self to your higher self, you do what's right for you. That's my instruction. You do what's right, not, not, not right for you. In the end, it's right for the whole. It's right for, if you're actually following your heart, you're following the proper, I don't know. I think that's what people should do. They should do what's best for themselves in terms of not selfishly, uh, not in a selfish way, but in like a moment monastic monism like we are all one that type of do what's best don't ignore yourself you are the closest thing you have to god you're you're not going to find god through anyone else you are your closest connection to your higher self so you know more than anyone else about what you should do and i think you should do that not in a selfish way but in a in it's weird it's like a what do they call that dichotomy or 
Well, I guess um, where where my mind's going is you're, you're, you're like describing you're sort of describing this. Doesn't. It's a it's a it's a yeah. dualistic. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's this uh, dualistic and I guess uh, um, yeah, it's a paradoxical universe um, for sure. Um, <clears throat> and it's hard it's hard paradox. it's hard to yeah. re- it's hard to There's wrestle so it's hard to wrestle paradoxes. with yeah it's hard to wrestle like it's it's that it was one of the things I had to wrestle with a couple of years ago was trying to like uh, in order to have. Uh, in order to have, you know, the good, you have to have the evil too. Um, like there's, uh, there's both, you know, um, yeah, there's, uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's both sides. Um, the yin and the, the yin and the yang, the, um, the life and the death part of the wave. Yeah. Um, like it's, 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 it's all there, and you can't, you can't have one without the other. Um, at least not in this, at least in this, where we find ourselves now, at least I think. Yeah, it's interesting. The paradoxes are are very often in the truth (laughs) in the truth you'll find a lot of paradoxes maybe because our brain just doesn't see both sides of the coin at the same time (laughs) but something about something about you can you can look at some truth from one angle and then from the opposite angle and you'll see it's the truth both times and you're like okay uh my my mind can't hold them both at the same time but (laughs) if your heart is willing to accept it then it's you can see it you can see that it's true so that's the thing. It's like they use words. I think it's I think it's kind of sad. Some some people use the word selfish, and uh, I think there's a reason to have a negative connotation for a word and to not dilute the word by saying, well, you know, doing the right thing is selfish. I'm like, well, that's BS because we're just diluting the language. Like, why would we do that? But then if you zoom in or zoom out at some scale, it's all true, no matter what your statement is. At some scale, it's true. So scale is important. Let's talk about scale. <laughs> scale, um, a negative one is negative, right? But on the scale of a thousand positives and one negative one, it's positive because the, the net, the whole is like, it, it's, it's negligible at that point. So this happens a lot where it, for my mind, because I, I look at a, I look at a statement or something and I, zoom in and I'm like, well, does it make sense zoomed in? Does it make sense zoomed out? Because it's it's not true. It's not like a core truth of the universe if it doesn't make sense in, in all scenarios. The, the but here is that that may be true. It's not like a core truth, but on some scale, it's true. And the scale that we're on now it's it's okay to eat plants. It's okay to eat animals for a lot of us. It's okay to uh, kill ants. It's okay to kill spiders. It's okay to spray pest control around your house. At this scale, at this location, there may come a time, and hopefully in my existence, I reach a world where it's just awful and terrible that anyone would eat an animal. I think that's kind of like a a world I would be well I would be interested in going to. But guess what? I still have hamburger in my in my freezer. So it, there's like things that are true when you when you inspect them with a magnifying glass, and then when you zoom out and see the scale of what what else is around, then you kind of have a different a different view of truth because it's because scale is important. Scale affects affects your decision. Yeah. I don't yeah, know no, if that you're made right. Any sense, but no, I'm I, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely with you, and uh, and I agree. I mean, I I just we just had a um, a post about it on Twitter and also in the Pasnia Telegram chat. But had a we just had this past you know month and a half or so had a, you know a lot of meat go in the freezer. So like I I you know I, I killed a lot of you know I, you know I I uh, you know processed a lot of bunnies and um, you know uh, lambs and goats and and all that you know ch- uh, chickens uh, ducks. So like, um, yeah, I did, you know, do, do all that. Um, but at some point, you know, like it would be good if, if that, if that need wasn't there, but, uh, if that need wasn't there, it'd be great. But, uh, um, at the same time, I, yeah, I mean, high quality animal nutrition is super important. So, um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. Hey man, <laughs> people, people believe they need to eat, you know, and I mean, I don't hold a lot of belief about certain things now, but Mm-hmm. I I still eat, you know, right. and I'm not trying to prove anyone wrong. I did I did fast for a while once to see. I I think I got seven days, and I was just curious. So I was like, mm-hmm. how far can my body go in case in case I need to not eat for a while? And uh, I'm not a I'm not a 
plump guy. So once I started to see my cheeks get thinner, I was like, yeah, I should probably start eating now. <laughs> but, but yeah, I got seven days and, and yeah, but the, the beliefs, maybe, maybe our model is wrong. And eventually in another uh, frame of mind, we won't need to eat anything. Maybe your energy comes from your energy source, you know, like a radio that doesn't need batteries. It just somehow gets its energy from the transmitter. Um, that's possible. I, I mean, to me, a lot of things are possible and uh, I don't rule it out. In fact, I, I'm open to having those possibilities in whatever world I choose to build if I choose to build it. Hi there. <laughs> anyway, I got some kids here, so. Um, no at all. You said, you said food and you mm-hmm. said... I'm going to pause for a second. We can cut this out if we need to, but otherwise they're sad. They got in trouble. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Okay. Let's go back on topic. I I was, I wanted to get to, because you said maybe one day you won't have to do that with the freezing meat and or uh, using meat to, um, to feed yourself. Mm -hmm. And it made me think of the greenhouses since that's part of our concept. And Sure. Being able to live inside of a climate controlled environment where it's basically tropical year round um, would allow you to have fruit on the trees year round and not have the need to preserve uh, food for different seasons. You'd be able to just eat what's in season at the time. And I, I believe, <laughs> I don't know enough about gardening, but uh, from my experience in tropical areas, you could, you could grow food year round in certain climates and if we can create that climate inside of a climate controlled greenhouse and then that greenhouse is large enough that you can bring your kitchen and your bathroom with you as you live um mobile lifestyle as you live in a way that you don't have to leave your bedroom and your kitchen and your bathroom behind um or or worse not worse, but like for me, when I build a house, when I put a lot of my energy into building something, there's some emotional attachment toward that uh, that home. Mm-hmm. And if I put too much energy into it, it kind of hurts to leave it. And I'm actually trying to, with what I'm building, trying to reduce all barriers of entry into the system and also reduce all of the... Uh, sticking points that would make you not want to live mobile. So that's one of them is if you live in an RV, even if it's an RV that like has massive pop out tents and things, it doesn't have to be climate controlled. Your RV doesn't. So you could have a pretty large house if you wanted that's that goes in your RV. Maybe they'll change the design of RVs to be primarily kitchens and bathrooms. And then you set up your master bedroom in a tent or something. I think that's all possible. Um, allowing people to easily, hopefully, easily move from one location to the other, because that's part of that's part of uh, your friends meeting you at a location. Is that at least some of your friends are going to have to move their location to get to you, and likely all of you, your entire friend group, is going to have to move from various parts of the world to meet you in one location. Yeah. We're yeah, getting so, off topic, but no, we're, no, the, we're, main, the main topic that I, that I talk about. <laughs> well, no, man, we're, we're right. Uh, we're right on there. Um, Cause I, I mean, we, we laid out a lot of really good background information um, and yeah, I guess a lot, a lot of good, you know, um, uh, yeah, background stuff, introductory stuff. So um, I, I, I think that was, and we can obviously dive back into that at, at any point. But um, you started getting into it a little bit, and um, I guess um, let's let's start to, to I guess uh, um, bring it down to the ground. You know, like a ground level. Like, a, what's your? Um, you you kind of went into it a little bit, but uh, give us kind of, a, a, I guess, a, a big overview of of um, I guess the decentralized network of these climate controlled greenhouses, massive greenhouses um, that you're that you're thinking about. Give give us a, give us an idea. Yeah, so let's go with a little more theory because I like theory and I Mm -hmm. I like examples. So imagine the United States was the best country in the world and everyone should want to be here. And for the sake of argument, right? And then 
think about how someone in North Korea is, it's kind of unfair to them because for them to join the United States, they would have to go very, very far. It's not as easy as them walking three miles, crossing the border into the United States, and then now being in the United States and able to experience the United States' benefits, how it's such a wonderful country for the sake of argument, you know? So the the fact that the country is the the best country in the world, presumably, is not distributed right now. The the land of that country is all clumped together, which means that other like the people that are throughout the earth don't have equal chances or easily easy chances of experiencing that world, that nation, to determine if they like that nation. So the best, to me, the best country doesn't exist yet in this sense of being easily accessible to everyone on the planet so that they can choose to try it out and see if they like it. That is one of the elements that I want to build into um, kind of what you said, second realm. I don't think your second realm is just going to encompass uh, 100 square miles in one location on the earth. I think it's going to encompass anywhere free people gather. Many <laughs> acres. Yeah. Many acres throughout the earth hopefully because hopefully mm -hmm. it's a good enough model. So churches do this. There's churches that are in every country. And so that's one one thing where the churches got it right and the nations didn't. You could say one one uh area. But yeah, that's that's what I envision for what I'm building. And then the next thing I envision is not requiring very much, if any, governance, because if you solve community, then the amount of governance that is needed reduces significantly, like probably near to near zero. Because when you solve community, then all of the people in that community are on the same wavelength, the same mental wavelength. So there's not a whole lot of disagreement to arbitrate or to, to resolve because they all kind of already agree how things should be run. And that's just, that's a belief I have. <laughs> I believe that we should solve community first before we even attempt to solve governance. And I believe that bad diversity, this is a new, a new, um, a new term that I haven't defined yet, but for, for this audience, but good diversity versus bad diversity. I think there's a lot of, um, in the world or in education, in education, there's a lot of pro-diversity sentiment, but pro-diversity doesn't divide it up into good diversity and bad diversity. And that you could see if you're listening to um, an orchestra, then you could compare the orchestra, which has good diversity. There's multiple instruments with multiple sounds, multiple notes, and multiple instruments to play those notes. You could compare that with bad diversity of just pure static, radio static. Um, and it goes into colors as well as freq uh, like frequencies of light, you know, colors, as mm. well as frequencies of sound, which is music. Because you might have... I don't know if anyone's seen this, but you might have seen it on a static on a TV screen. It's just like black and white. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not pretty, you know, so that is still diversity, but it's bad diversity in this in this model of good diversity versus bad diversity. And I think that the powers that be that wish uh, wish to keep us enslaved not all powers that be, but the ones that wish to keep us enslaved, they want that bad diversity because it's the, uh, you know, divide and conquer type thing where you're sitting next to someone, your next door neighbor, and your, your 10 nearest next door neighbors don't know that much about you and they don't know you and they don't care about you. That's bad diversity. When you could find people that know you basically because they know themselves and you're basically similar. You know, then they know you because they know themselves and they're similar, just like a gold particle in inside of a clump of clump of dirt at the mine. There might be a lot of gold, 
in a clump of dirt, but that gold isn't very valuable to the person mining it until they can separate it out and put the gold particle next to the gold particle next to the gold particle next to the gold particle. It's once it's refined, it's more valuable. And so that you go from bad diversity to no diversity when you when you just completely only live with your own clone. And then from no diversity, which is better than bad diversity, then you go to an alloy or you go from a really pure, clean note in an orchestra that's monotone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then you go to multiple notes and and they change over time and then you get some beauty out of it. So this is the good diversity versus bad diversity. And the proponents of diversity in our world today, many of them just think that diversity is good no matter what. Um, but as a scientist, as an engineer, you're not going to just say that, hey, diversity is always good. No, you're going to say sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Yeah. I want good diversity in terms of my communities. I don't want to just only be around people that, are, that always think like me. But I do want to be around a significant number of people that think just like me and then have other wavelength personality types that also have neighbors that think just like them. And we can intermingle, you know, so we can learn and grow from each other. We can have a beautiful. Uh, it's almost like the the land would be singing the people, the if you were able to look at the frequencies of the, the families that enter a certain geographic area and you see that they 10 families that are all basically identical move into a geographic area and they are compatible and they work well with the rest of the, that community. And then some people move out of that community and all of those people that are the same move out. Then over time, it's like you could see a, a song being played on that in that geographic area because you're having these frequencies come in and go and they blend well. They're in harmony with the other frequencies that are there. So that's the musician side of it, the artistic side of what I hope happens with uh, wh what I hope happens with my future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really, <laughs> I'm kind of working toward me finding a future where I have. Uh, many people that I get along with and that I like hanging out with and that I spend my time doing that. And if it turns out we need to work, I, I really doubt that we're going to need to work for the purpose of providing our basic needs. I think once you have your greenhouse built, once you have your uh, systems set up, you just have to be able to walk out your door and pick stuff out of your garden and cook it. You know, it's, it's not work at that point. It's just basic, you know. Yeah, so I guess that's the um, uh, the uh, the first uh, parallel that comes to mind here is uh, it's for different reasons though. Um, you're talking about I guess your your vision, your, I guess why you decided that, uh, um, or, or why I guess your reasoning behind uh, you know making it uh, you know without a jurisdiction per se, um, or you know like uh, not geographically oriented. Um, but yeah, that was uh, um, I guess that was. Uh, yeah, different reasons, but yeah, Pasni is a decentralized country too, um, and it was more so for um, yes. Uh, obviously, if it's a single location, it makes it very easy, you know, single point of failure um, in, in network terms. But uh -huh. uh, um, if uh, you know Pasni is in, in different jurisdictions, uh, it's a lot harder to stop. And uh, and if there's an entire parallel network, and um, and yeah, if it's an entire parallel network, then yes, yeah, it's, it's a lot harder to control. Um, so yeah, I'm right there, right there with you, and that's that's interesting. Um, that's a really interesting way to, to, to come to that, to come to a similar approach per se. Yeah. Hmm. Yep. You get safety. You get more safety in being part of a network, but also being um, able to move within the network. Because if you're stuck at your house and atomic bomb falls, even if you had four hours notice, it's like, well, I guess we're dying here, or we leave without all our stuff. But given enough notice and your ability to move things start looking a little, you know, shady, you can act because you're mobile, but a lot of us aren't that mobile. We've got, we've got roots. Yeah. <laughs> when you have roots in a geographic area, then you're a tree, you know? 
Yeah, that's that's a, a good you're, point too. Is, a uh, yeah, that's that's it's a good point too. Is that that Pazni has founded, or I guess not Pazni, but but, but Vanu, um, the Vanu, um, the strategy of Vanu um, is very much based on mobility. So uh, van nomadism. Um, a lot of people that come here to to Veritas Pazni are already van nomads. So um, that's the other thing too. Is I mean, there's there's already people out there looking for networks like these. Um, so yeah, very good. Yeah, so. That's what I was trying to do um, was solve community by finding a way to get 10 million people involved and then organize them so that out of the 10 million, we find the 100 best match for you, for each of you, and uh, get them, convince them to move to wherever you are and you move to wherever they are so that you can be ge geographically proximate to them. And uh, so methods for that were... Um, if people didn't need to have a job to participate, I think that lowers the barrier of entry because if people need to have a job in order to participate, then they can't be as mobile. But if we can eliminate their need to have a job, then that's good. Eliminate mm -hmm. their need to use money. That's good. It lowers the barrier of entry. Mm -hmm. So what I've done is designed it so that the cost of a membership it's almost like a timeshare honestly where you you buy this timeshare and or you work for that timeshare because the cost of the assets that we're building and creating the cost is primarily not money the cost is primarily time and effort um, from people willing to build so since that is the primary cost then I I put the base currency of the system is not dollars or any other fiat currency. The base currency of the system is time. So one minute in this uh, system, one minute worked equals to one currency unit, which is called stake in the system. So it's like getting shares of a timeshare and you can work or you can pay someone else to work. But basically the work is what creates the value. The money doesn't create the value. So once you have your timeshare, let's say you have $30,000 worth of timeshare and that's the cost to create, to build one of these um, greenhouses. And I know I counteracted myself because I don't actually know the exact number of minutes or stake that will be assigned to each greenhouse. But in the blockchain implementation of this, the DAO will uh, have a way of appraise appraising the value of the greenhouse that gets built and uh, appraising how many minutes it would take to build it again if we had to build more, which we will constantly be building more. So. Um, so because of that, then it has a number of stake and then the, the DAO would mint the stake and then buy the, buy the asset with the stake that they minted. And then the asset would, all the stake would be asset backed basically. And they would be tied to that specific as, asset so that if the asset burns down, then there's a chance that you, or is unkempt or whatever, then there's a chance that you lose your value just to keep things fair basically. But anyway, you get 1% per month on what you, the stake that you own. And the 1% is like credits in the timeshare world um, toward like you would in the Airbnb world, you would bid on or choose to rent someplace based on the cost of renting that place. Um, so in the community DAO, no, asset DAO actually, in the asset DAO, DAO, Distributed Autonomous Organization. Asset is like asset management, a property management type thing that's decentralized with no employees. It just kind of runs. I'm going fast, I know. Well, you're okay, good, you're so good, man. here's the situation. You buy or you work to get $30,000 worth of stake, which is equivalent to timeshares. Once you have those stake, in fact, as even if you have just a few, then you're getting 1% per month because that's just how I decided to do it. Everyone gets 1% per month, which is like 12% per year. 
points, which are credits, and you spend your points to reserve your where you're going to stay. Okay, so that's how the asset DAO works. The community DAO, which is um, I have another name for it called We Church, just so that we can uh, yeah. use a church name if we choose to for property tax and other other protections. Um, so the community DAO will be the one that is char that is um, trying to solve community. And the people who are following that community DAO uh, game, we'll call it, or instruction or algorithm, those people get a 75% discount on their rent. So what happens then is the community DAO says, hey, you can move anywhere you want. But if you move to this place, this place, or this place, based on what we know about you, then you will get a 75% discount. So then you are more likely to choose a place where you get a discount because one way or another, you're either saving points or you are moving to a much nicer place than you would otherwise be able to. So not that it took more to build the greenhouse in that location or even to buy the land, but it could be have higher value to members because it's on a nice lake or it's near a ski resort or whatever it happens to be that gives it more value. So you get to bid higher and stay in nicer locations if you're willing to play the game of eventually you finding your best friends and meeting them and being able to interact with them and live near them. So that's how the two things work. So you get 1% per month is how many credits you get, which I call them points in the white paper for the for the uh, blockchain side of this, the DAO. So you got stake and you have points. And then we will use the, yeah, that's how, that's how it works. So then you'll be spending your points. You never spend your stake because the stake represents the actual asset that was built. And hopefully that asset continues to be valuable just like a house continues to be valuable. And then you don't necessarily earn anything for for owning stake in a certain location. It's just how much stake you own. You get 1% per month in in points for that. So that's how I'm hoping to make this scalable. And I'm, I'm designing the greenhouses. I'm designing the greenhouses so that they are simple to build. Um, low in terms of number of materials. Um, eventually we're going to be 3D printing, concrete 3D print the walls, and then we backfill them with dirt. So it's like an underground greenhouse, but the where you drive up with your RV is ground level, and it's got a big tall garage door, basically. And you park your RV inside of it, and then you live indoor-outdoor. You don't breathe chemtrails anymore because your garden is purifying and conditioning your air so that it's actually healthy for you. So you have like either permaculture or hydroponics or something to keep your uh, keep yourself fed basically, and you have no other expenses. The the, I mean you can have other expenses. Realistically, people want internet and they want a cell phone and stuff. And we will have ways that people can earn money. Um, in fact, one way to earn money in this system is helping us build greenhouses and then selling the stake that you earned because you actually built the thing and sold it to the, or at least, you know, like when you upload your house on Airbnb. Um, so kind of that is what you end up doing with your properties, the assets, the greenhouses that you helped build. Then you can have a way more stake than you actually need. And you can sell that to people who actually have money and they don't, they don't want to, or they don't have time to go build greenhouses. They can spend their money on it. So there's going to be an exchange rate between all other currencies and um, or at least between dollars and Bitcoin and whatever and stake. So right now I set the exchange rate with without actually having very many people and having this built yet. But for the for the start, I'm just saying one stake equals one dollar. But uh, eventually, if we have people that are rich that want to buy this buy in and then people that are poor that would rather just work 
and give their time to gain ownership in the system, then the price of those stake just go up because the only people buying stake are rich and the people earning stake are using their time to do it. Anyway, yeah, that's a lot. <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, definitely tell you put a lot of thought into it. Um, definitely. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a sort of second realm timeshare type thing. I like it. I really, really like it. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess, um, there was, there's something else you mentioned a couple of, a couple of weeks ago when we talked and it's, it's something that I haven't really, like, I guess the second realm strategy for it, um, in terms of like, you know, the private pro so-called private property ownership to like actually have like a homestead or something like that. Um, second realm strategy for that is the, the best one is utilizing a proxy merchant and then just basically not having any of your, like not being, you know, identified with that property essentially. So like, uh, I guess, um. Uh, what's, uh, I guess, what's, are there any approaches that you're looking at, um, as far as the, the land situation, um, I guess in relation to the, the first realm in the survival society, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah. So it turns out if you study remedy, I'm going to say on the legal side, uh, of inside the matrix, but going up the legal ladder or the lawful or the equity or whichever you want to call it um, because there's it's like many rabbit holes but it turns out when you're in that space you you have ways of just provisioning the property so that people will leave it alone and so that you don't have to pay property taxes on it um, the one that we're probably most most close to doing is um, it would be like a tribe like an indian tribe it's going to be a tribal land, and um, but other ways that it's that it's understood is something called a charter. So each county, each county in each state has a charter, and uh, you can also think of it like the Vatican. Vatican City is like its own nation, and it receives that status by um, basically doing things filing paperwork, uh, sending notices to certain areas. But eventually there's a way that you can play with the big guys in a sense where they'll leave you alone. That's the method that I'm going down right now is just making friends with people that are good at legal stuff, not lawyers because lawyers are, are liars. But um, there are people that are good at legal stuff that are not liars as far as I know. So that's my methodology there. I do, I eventually, okay, let me go with the other methodology though. Before thinking about using paperwork to, uh, to get the matrix to leave you alone, or I, I don't know what to say, but to get police officers to leave you alone. Let's just say police officers are the, are the face of the abuse. So to get police officers to leave you alone, aside from legal methods, um, so, you know, there's those two methods. You could use the, the legal structure where you write some words on a paper and you send it to a certain place and then people leave you alone. But before, with a more, a more basic mind, uh, first principles thinking, the things we're all afraid of are at least me, right? And I think almost everyone else. The things that we're worried about with respect to the law is that they might send us letters in the mail, which doesn't seem that scary, but you know, that's kind of what we were about, and that they might put us in jail. It's unlikely that you're going to have any worse consequences than that, which means, I mean, they pull you over too, right? But uh, which means that if we could create a protection union, aka other words for this that are that have, you know, bad connotation is like a mafia or a, a gang or something. But those, those types of organizations that do not require permission to receive their validity. So they are their own certificate authority. They, they make sure that they are valid within themselves. They don't need to go ask for permission to be valid. Those are the those are the examples that I know. There's some other relationships in the world that obviously don't need to be written down to be true, like father and son or 
I mean, husband and wife is almost like it's, it's not valid unless it's, <laughs> it's hilarious. Not valid unless you've got permission from the state. Makes no sense. <laughs> Makes no sense <laughs> at all. But we've allowed that. We've allowed <laughs> certain things. But you don't have to have paperwork to be a, a son and a father, you know? Like that relationship, parent-child relationship, and I'm using the wrong words for people that are good at law. You know that I'm saying the wrong words here. But you understand that you don't need it to be written down anywhere for it to be true that that guy's your dad. You shouldn't need it written down anywhere for it to be true that that lady's your wife. But okay, it is what it is. So there's some relationships in the world that don't require you to ask permission and get some paperwork written down for them to be true. But most organizations, churches, a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of churches, if they don't have a charter, if they don't have something written down, then they're not legitimate. They're not, at least some people don't see them as legitimate. So yeah, the realm that I want, I, I want less attachment and I don't necessarily want, it's not important that it not be written down, but it's almost better when it's not written down. Like, like the laws of the laws of nature aren't necessarily written down and it would only be a problem if they were written down because they'd get it wrong. The, the laws of nature, they are their own, they are their own evidence of existence. Gravity is its own evidence of existence. You don't need a textbook for it to be true. Whereas a church and an, uh, a corporation, uh, many organizations are seen as not legitimate if they don't have some, king somewhere or organization somewhere holding a record that says oh yeah they asked for permission and i don't want to ask for permission primarily just because i i was raised in the household i was where like asking permission was not the most likely way for you to get your way the most likely for me to get my way as a child was to uh just take it and try and not get caught Which i know that's bad it's trauma you know childhood trauma but it's still with me and I still think it's valid where I don't consider myself free if I have to ask for my freedom. I just don't understand how that's free. I think mm -hmm. it's better if you can say, uh, bring your own freedom to the table and say, here's my freedom and, and I brought it, I made it, I created it, I, it came through me, you know? you know? Even if it came from God, it came down through me and this is my freedom. So freedom in that sense is a protection union that you don't have to register it for it to exist. Same reason I want to use a DAO. I don't want to use a DAO that you register in Wyoming. Why the fuck would you use a DAO if, uh, if you're going to go ask for permission again? It makes sense. <laughs> I think the purpose of decentralized, it's like registering your Bitcoin uh, project before you are allowed to <laughs> enlist miners and doing and mining it. It's like, anyway, so, what am I saying? Same, I think I was saying that protection points. unions are good. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I just know, I just realized that sometimes I'm, I go on tangents and I don't follow my own train of thought and I'm, and I need to follow the, the heart of what's important for you to hear. That's the important thing for me to do. So anyway, when I say protection union, I, I spoke about this at the summit, the freedom summit that I was um, participated in over the weekend. And I think some people got the idea that they're like, Oh, I want to join the protection union. And I'm like, <laughs> it's a concept. I just used the word as a concept. It's like the concept of a mafia versus the mafia. It's like, well, which mafia, right? So the concept is if you want help getting your ass out of jail, how are you going to get help getting your ass out of jail? Pray hard. Okay, great. First, first step, pray hard. Second step, you're not in jail yet. You're wise enough to know you might someday get there, maybe, for whatever reason, jaywalking, I don't know. Uh, world is changing. You know, police are pulling you over for stupider things. I don't know. Any reason, you might find yourself in jail. So how are you going to get yourself out of jail? Wouldn't it be nice if five of your friends already had practice in knowing what letters to send to the court so that they would let you out of jail? Yeah. And it is as fucking easy as that. It's a little bit of freaking paperwork. Sometimes you have to send more paperwork because sometimes the judges would rather, you know, judges, I say judges, man, the, the officers, the police officers, the 
the district attorneys, all those people, sometimes they'd rather dig themselves in a deeper hole. So sometimes you have to send more paperwork, but you never have to really do anything uh, to do it other than send paperwork. But do you know what to say on that paperwork? Do you know how to um, submit a lawsuit against those people that are holding your friend? And is it going to be very easy if you're the one in jail, you don't have those friends, and you're supposed to now learn the law from the law library in jail and figure out on your own how to get out of jail from inside. It doesn't make sense. So since you're not sitting in jail yet, maybe it makes sense to start helping people get out of jail that shouldn't be there just as practice, just as a way of testing your knowledge and uh, building up that knowledge. Your protection union, you're always, so taxes, taxes is a form of building someone else's protection union. It's like the protection money you pay to the mafia. Well, you can pay them or you can pay your own protection union. Either way, you might have to pay some taxes. The United States has to do things that are taxing, right? They have to maintain a standing army ish, right? So that's taxing because that takes a lot of energy from the nation that if we were a peaceful society and we didn't have any enemies, we wouldn't have to do that, would we? So we all have that, uh, every, even a nation in the, that's at the top of the food chain, even when you completely move yourself from the, the system in terms of being underneath anyone else, you still might have to pay taxes, just you don't have to pay it to the UN. You don't have to pay it to anyone, but it's still something you have to do that's taxing Learning the law is taxing. It might take you a few years of your life, which is 2% of your life, which is significant. <laughs> That's a big tax. But you're building your own wall around your own city instead of being a slave, building the wall around the city that enslaves you, uh, that awesome. keeps you in, or that even if it protects you, you're serving a king you don't want to serve. That's the problem, okay? If you're serving a king you do want to serve, then there is no problem. You're fucking doing it right. That's what you're supposed to do. So the concept is this. You're going to spend some time or money protecting yourself if you choose to. You don't have to choose to protect yourself, but if you choose to protect yourself, which is a step below just acting in faith and walking in faith and just like following your heart and enjoying the experience. And when you die, you die. That's better. I agree. Anyone that knows how to do that or it feels, you know, they meditated enough that they're like totally fine with that. That is superior in my mind. But the people that wish to have some help if they ever get put in prison and have some help from someone other than themselves, you are your own help. You are your future self and your other self and your past self. So if you want to do something nice for your future self, then maybe you invest. If you want to do something nice for your past self, then maybe you do some uh, emotional healing work and you go heal your past and you forgive your past and you forgive yourself in doing so your future self is going to forgive you for how you act today and uh also you could be benefited from your past if your past self had invested then now you would have the fruit of that investment well your other self is the other people around you and one day you're going to be in their shoes one day they're going to be in your shoes. If you want to invest in some of that uh, benefits so that you don't have as hard of a time when it comes your time to sit in a jail cell, then maybe it's time while you're free to help other people that are in jail and help yourself learn how to get out of jail. So that's one basis of the protection union idea, the concept. The other basis Going back to the simple, I was trying to get to the simple part. The simple part is without any paperwork, without any of that, all you have is police officers might pull you over, you might get letters in the mail, and you might get put in jail. Okay, really simple, right? In a simple sense, you need a protection union to help you out in that scenario. And also, in a simple sense, the level playing field is actually a good idea. So a level playing field would be police officer pulls you over, he freaks you out, your wife's sitting in the car, and you guys sit there for half an hour. He wastes half an hour of your time. You're just living your personal life. You're not on the clock. He's getting paid to do it. 
So this is not a level playing field. Oh, we both spent half an hour here. No, 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 no. Here's a level playing field. After he pulls you over and makes you sit on side of the road for 30 minutes, then you and your protection union guys go out when he's on his personal time sitting with his wife in the car and you pull him over and make him sit on the side of the road for 30 minutes. Now see what happens. Because otherwise, if all they had to do was pay you a million dollars for the trouble that you were damaged by their uh, inconveniencing you 30 minutes, even if you win a million dollar lawsuit, they didn't have to pay that because it comes out of their freaking free money account. They can spend as much as they want. No one loses. The police officer loses nothing if he loses a lawsuit. No one loses anything. Everyone just goes away with more money than they had before. The lawyers do. The judges do. Everyone's on the clock. Everyone's getting paid. You walk away with a million dollars. Who lost the million dollars? No one. You, you don't believe it, but it's the truth. No one fucking lost the damn thing. So what happens is level playing field means time for time or inconvenience for inconvenience. Um, and for me, if one of our guys gets put in jail and we don't know all the paperwork shit, but we got a hundred guys, then we're like, we go pick up the governor or the police officer that put him in or whatever. We say, we go get a body and we say, Hey, you're playing the game on the County side. You're playing the game on the matrix side. You're playing the game like this. You know, I'm going to give you one gun with one bullet, but there's eight of us that have one gun with one bullet and you're in, you're in our custody. Start making calls, get our friend out of jail. And that way, what are you? You're just a mafia that's not doing anything wrong. But you didn't have to learn any paperwork. You didn't have to do any of that. And I know that to many people that sounds extreme. That's extremism. Oh, my God. But to me, that's a fucking level playing field. How is that not level playing field? You took their time. They took yours. I'm going to give them the courtesy of having a way to defend themselves because I think that's only, for, that's only fair. You know, if you're if you're you should have you should have one shot, you know. Everyone should get one gun, one bullet, or no guns, no bullets, or whatever, but no one should be abused by the system without at least the choice to go kamikaze on somebody, you know? Because that way it keeps us in order, too. If we're, if we're a protection union, then we at least have to have respect. The guy's got a gun, at least. I don't want to be the first one to piss him off. But anyway, weird, <laughs> weird concepts. But level playing field isn't a weird concept. People understand it, and they just don't know how to apply it to their interaction with government to me your interaction with everyone else it, there shouldn't be any government that you have to interact with separately it's you and everyone else but it's not going to work very well if it's just you it's going to work well if it's you and your protection union against everyone else and their protection unions and they think they're protecting something when they put you in jail and they go to afghanistan and freaking steel oil or whatever they're doing you know everyone thinks they're protecting something but that's i don't have a solution for that that's for god but for you maybe you as in the audience and myself included um maybe consider putting some effort into creating and joining a protection union maybe create some treaties between your protection union and other protection unions so that if you need a little bit more firepower for something or just knowledge, honestly, it seems like that's confrontational leveling the playing field and like taking the, taking the governor and putting him in jail until your guy gets taken out of jail. That does seem extreme to me as well, because the truth is all we have to do is learn the paperwork. And if we are combined enough with other protection unions, we'll probably not go as extreme <laughs> as a level playing field. We'll probably just say, you know what? They're annoying, but they don't do anything to us because we always file the right paperwork and they always let us go. Mm -hmm. So you could have a little QR code on your license plate. Instead of a regular license plate, you could just put the QR code and the officer before he pulls you over can scan the QR code and it'll have the, uh, the central phone number for who he can call to talk to about that vehicle. And it's going to be someone in your protection union that's on call, ready to answer his call. And they're also experienced with talking to cops and telling them to go to hell or whatever. <laughs> no, they do their job right. That's what they need to be told to do. Do your job and do it right. Um, assuming your job is to protect the people. I'm going too far. 
anyway, there, the, that's just a general concept. It's not like you have to con like join a specific uh, union that is already established. It's just the idea that you should be willing to and that you should build one like for yourself. And you don't even have to tell anyone about it. You just have to make sure that you all are on the same page and you're all going to have each other's backs. And you should you should donate your time to helping free other people. You should. Yeah. Because you want to be free someday. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, you're you're right. Uh, you're right on there. Yeah, definitely. So I guess uh, a question for you, um, since it seems like you've got um, you got more knowledge in the space than I do at this point, at least at, at this point, at least. But uh, do you have any suggestions for guests on, I guess, uh, um, like the most power, I guess the most, uh, some of the legal things you mentioned, like the, uh, I guess, the proper paperwork, anyone that would be willing to, uh, you know, to, to share what they can? So I, I, let me tell you what, I'm going to say spirit. I know that everyone's freaking got different beliefs. I've been atheist. I sort of still am. So I don't believe in an external God. I believe I am God. So how's that for atheist? All right. But spirit, I'm just going to say it. Spirit told me that all I have to do is build. That's all I have to do. Build the assets. I just have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, also, my my... Uh, I mean, it didn't tell me I couldn't go down the legal route, the legal rabbit holes and stuff. It was just like, I don't need to. So the truth is I'm not the right person to help you get out of jail or um, find that paperwork. I do have lots of network connections now because of it. But my primary, my primary uh, directive from the God is that I am, uh, I'm focused on community actually. So I don't think that we're going to not be able to solve those problems. I think that we will be able to, and I can connect people to the learning and we can start classes and we can start protection unions that are more focused on, you know, paper terrorism, they call it, you know, sending papers, <laughs> uh, but don't do, don't do paper terrorism because terrorism is bad. But uh, basically we can have protection unions that are not focused on learning, you know, how to pull an officer over or whatever. And it's just focused on how to submit the paperwork that gets his ha ass in the hot seat. Um, we can do that. That's possible. And I have the connections for that. And we're going to do that. Ultimately though, it's probably going to end up just like for the most, most of our people we will probably just drive around our cars without license plates on them. And maybe with a QR code that, that tells the, the officer basically, if they pull us over and make us stop, then they're going to start paying, you know, it's going to cost them. They're going to pay whatever. I think the fair payment is their time for our time. I think that's fair, but we could charge them, you know, a thousand dollars a minute or something crazy because we can. So, uh, we can also hold them personally liable, which means that their immunity is no longer, it's what's it called? It might be called sovereign immunity, but basically they have some immunity where if they're doing what they're supposed to, then the United States is going to stand behind their back and say, you know what, I got this guy. He was doing what he was supposed to. He was acting within his bounds. But we have paperwork and knowledge enough to know that if he's not on government property, which the roads aren't government property, that's not county land, and where your house is isn't government property. So we, we have in the protection unions that are focused on paperwork, they're going to be able to hold these people personally liable, which means that the the attorneys won't be able to really help them get out of it. They're just going to have to lose their house or whatever it is. But I'm just I'm I'm further forward in this. I, my awareness is to the point in the future. I say to the point. I mean, like in the future, far enough where we all have like virtually unlimited resources. And my awareness says what from there, that's where I started. You know, when you start the maze from the, the end and then go back forward, it, it makes things a lot more clear. So getting out of the rat race became a really easy problem when I'm like, well, we need to just get rid of money. Okay. Well, how are we going to do that? Well, we got to make, maintain our needs. Well, what about, I don't want to rely on other people to 
supply my basic needs because if I can't rely on myself for that, then I'm enslaving someone, forcing them to do it. And, and also, if I have to, that's not exactly true because I could give to them, they could give to me. But I don't even want to rely on barter and trade for my basic needs. I want to be able to eat food from outside my back door. That's where I want to eat my food from. I want to be able to stay warm, not because I paid someone or worked for it. I want it to just stay warm. My area where I'm living, it's just going to stay climate controlled. How are we going to do that? A little bit of solar power and some geothermal, open loop geothermal, which means you're going to take the aquifer under the ground with all the water in it. You're going to put hot water down in the summer so that you pre-warm it so that in the winter you can reverse the direction. So you have two water wells instead of one, which means you just flow the water back one direction during the summer, the other direction during the winter. And what happens is you are using the ground as a battery, a thermal battery. So it is storing that energy that is oh. abundant in the summer and it's also abundant in the winter. You can cool down a lot of water in the winter. You just put it outside and run it through some radiator loops and just then put it down in the ground. And the same thing happens in the summer. The summer, you're taking that cold, cold water that's not just the regular temperature of the aquifer, but it's colder because you cooled down all the dirt down there. All the, the mass of the thermal mass, there's a lot of energy that you can hold in that thermal mass. And you've cooled it down during the winter. So in the summer, what you do is you pull from really, you know, ice cold water out of that aquifer. And then at the end of the line, you don't just send it down into the earth. You run it through some heat loops because it's summer. You've got unlimited heat. So you heat that water up and then put it down in the ground. And then what happens to that? You All you need is two pumps, one in each well. They might have to pump quite a bit of water. They might take a lot of energy, but nothing near the energy it would take to run an air conditioner. So you do that and you need not as many solar panels to heat or cool your greenhouse. Plus it's a greenhouse and it's halfway underground. It's, it's basically an underground greenhouse anyway. So it's already climate controlled to some extent, but we make it better. And this is low tech uh, stuff. I'm still going cool, but I don't remember where I was talking about before I got to the that was a, a good digression. Dude, oh, here's what I was saying. Like energy set, energy talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of it. So here's what I was saying about like uh, if you have a friend and you interact with them because of work or because you need them, like the milkman or whatever in olden days, now it's all going away because nobody needs relationships anymore to survive, to eat, to like keep their blood pulse going. Before you needed you needed each other to keep your pulse running. Now you don't. Now you just need a cell phone and a debit card, which basically means you don't need to talk to anyone to survive. You could survive years and years going to Walmart, buying your stuff, paying your rent with your debit card and paying your, you know, if you're a trust fund kid, you can survive forever like that, not talking to anyone. Well, there's some good and bad to that. The bad is you lose those relationships that would have been convenient and forced because you know him because you need him. You know the mechanic because you need the mechanic. You know the plumber because you have to call him every once in a while. Um, once the needs go away, the relationships sometimes go away. The forced relationships go away, which is a beautiful, painful process. I put myself through it so that I could see uh, what's beyond it. And that's how I came to community. So that's why I'm here helping you guys before you have to get all depressed that you have all this money and no friends. <laughs> but you don't want to have friends that they need you to survive. Because the friends that like you for who you are are better than the ones that need you for who you are. Um, says me. Uh, and so that's why I don't really want to require barter and trade for me to wipe my ass, for me to have food to eat, for me to have a warm house. I want to just live next to people that organically I like to hang out with. And if we choose to do projects together and work together and earn money, maybe if we choose, you know, that's totally good. We can do that. I just don't want it to be for things that we rely on, basic needs. 
I don't want to be going to relying on the Costco for me to eat food. Because if Costco goes away, if the world ends for the Matrix, but not for the rest of us, then then we're going to have that painful moment where we're like, oh, shoot, all the slaves stopped working. Well, why'd they stop working? Well, God shut the Matrix down. Oh, shit. So who's going to make my... Who's going to make my sandwich now? Who's going to who's going to make my Subway sandwich now? Because I haven't worked for a Subway for years because you know, I've never worked for one. But, you know, I know how to make a sandwich. I know how to make pretty good food. But I still buy my stuff at the grocery store. And that's something I I think we want to build away from. Yeah. Even if we can be rich and we can buy stuff, I want to build away from it. So the people that want to build away from it with me, I hope they'll, you know, go that route with me. The people that like the idea of enslaving others, and I, I don't mean to say that and say that now you need to feel bad for buying stuff from the grocery store. I just mean it like, I just mean it like uh, <laughs> that I don't want to do that anymore and that I kind of feel like you're enslaving others when you trade a resource that is uh, just money. Money is worthless and you're giving it to them and they worked hard for that money. And it's worthless at the same time because you can just sell a digital item you could sell an nft and end up with an, uh, enough money that you could get some guy to work for 2000 hours it's a little bit bs actually i mean i mean it's all right it's a world it's a world and it's an interesting one but the people that want to go away from that world and they want to just sub, like take care of their own needs for the most part i say in this world that i'm building we help automate the hydroponics so we get arduinos and and yes, not everyone learns to code their own Arduino. What they're going to do is they're going to just download a file onto the SD card and plug it in and follow the instructions to set up their hydroponics setup, and it's just going to run. It's just going to be a garden that they always have food. And yes, they're not the experts. They're relying on the coders. But within our that, that level of um, helping each other out, I'm not trying to get rid of because I'd like to automate our basic needs as well so that we don't actually have to do anything to to survive um yeah yeah and uh and it's, it's doable it's really yeah. freaking doable that's exactly what i was going to say it's definitely doable um especially with um i mean just look just looking at one area and, and you mentioned your open the open thermal thermal geo uh, geothermal or the uh, open geothermal system which is uh which is open really loop. really great um but uh, uh yeah a lot of these other uh you know breakthrough energy solutions like if if once that choke point um you know once once you can um i guess yeah that once that i guess uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of possibilities out there i guess it's just we're, we're all, i'll leave it now in january i'm going to be doing a uh, exactly i'm going to be doing a, a breakthrough energy series with some really really incredible people um I've got a few confirmations already so um I'll, I'll leave it there for now but there's a lot of possibilities um and some just uh, you know right 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 around the corner so um i think once like that that alone um the uh once the you know the independent uh, energy is solved that will be uh that will be huge um they'll be absolutely huge yep and we can do things i i'm just like the we can do things to get free money like mining crypto when you use <laughs> when free using, energy yeah exactly i've already thought kind of like that, you yeah. didn't do a lot to do that yeah <laughs> and so like yeah. So in that sense, it's also another way of you kind of hacking the matrix and is, just yeah. coming to the matrix with dollars that you created. And you're like, hey, trade these for your time. And it's like, I've got my regrets with that. I <laughs> I do have my regrets with that. But at the same time, knowing that it's possible and like rather simple for us, if we do create what I'm proposing, it's not going to be hard for us to find those people and tell them, hey, you know how to make per like free energy. You know how to do the breakthrough energy. Well, why don't you come to our little, you know, reservation or whatever, our little community where we've got hundreds of these greenhouses, uh, underground greenhouses, and we got people living there already. And there's a place for you. You know, come. Let's do a little conference. And uh, we can do conferences at these sites where we have, like, one of them's 40 acres. Uh, I, I have the forty acres already. Okay, yeah. So, and so it's gonna you're at one hundred and ninety-two so units. Yep. So you're you're at a good point here. Um. So like the current status, you're talking. So yeah, current status. Tell us about like what's what's physically. I guess yeah. You're you're kind of getting into it now, but um. Yeah. So um, yeah. 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 So I have. I live in Milford, Utah. 
I have five acres in Adamsville, Utah, which is 25 minutes drive from my house. I moved out here from Salt Lake City because I was able to find this five acres for a good price. The five acres will have 24 units on it. They're going to be about 3,000 3, square foot each greenhouse. Um, the ceiling's going to be like 16 feet high, so you're going to park your RV in just fine. Um, that's five acres, and that's going to be the first um, place that we build. And we're working on with another, with the tribe, the, the reservation tribes, like the Indian tribes. They're not Indian, but they're Israel, tribe of Israel, something like that. They're, they're going to help me um, get the land outside of the United States, even though the land's not moving, but you change the, the layering, the jurisdiction of it. Interesting. Anyway, so we haven't done that yet, but we're going to do that part. And people are going to be able to move out there. And um, I'm open to having people move out there right now. So if anyone on the, like, if anyone wants to move out there, um, there's going to be a price. We're going to sell the, the little lots. Um, but there's 24 there. And then there's another place called Utah OSR, which stands for Operation Self-Reliance. I'm not affiliated, but I did buy land right next to them. So I have 40 acres that is just north of them. Um, it's in Tooele County. They're, they're in Juab County. So we're right across the county line. And uh, it's adjacent to them. 40 acres is going to fit 192 units that are 4,000 square foot each. And uh, the unit is, you know, it's like 100 and, 130, 120, 130 feet long and by like 30 feet wide and uh, 16 feet tall, high. And it's the walls are like 12 feet thick backfilled with dirt if anyone's heard of a gabion cage you've probably seen them before it's like a cage a metal cage they fill it with rocks what we're going to do for the that 12 foot thick wall we're going to fill it with dirt and we're going to use cables concrete tension cables every four feet in a grid in a grid pattern throughout it so that the walls don't um come apart and uh we'll use like a pole barn style setup so we're just going to use um this is the plan. I haven't built them yet. Um, but we're going to use concrete tension cables that can hold a lot of weight so that the dirt can be in that 12 foot and it'll be caged with um, wooden poles and uh, wire fencing, like cattle fencing the six inch square little squares. And then some, you know, a liner, like a waterproof liner to so how many how many pieces of equipment or, or uh, materials? We've got like poles, we've got metal fencing, we've got plastic, and we've got uh, cables, tension cables. And that's your 12 foot thick wall of solid dirt between each unit. And and at the back end of it as well. So the only the front is open to be able to park your RV inside of it. And it's not open, It's it's uh, you'll have a door on it. Okay, so 192 of those um, near that other off-grid community. And that off-grid community is like not close to the city, whereas the first one near uh, in Adamsville is seven minutes from Beaver, Utah. So there's grocery stores, there's a reservoir nearby, there's a ski resort um, up the canyon from Beaver. Uh, it's called Eagle Point. And it's not the busiest ski resort because there's not as many big cities nearby that don't have their own ski resort so so it's a good ski resort i guess i haven't been up there yet because <laughs> i don't ski but um i have gone a couple times anyway th it's a good site it's a good place to build one of these it's going to be a five acres we're going to build 24 of them and then we're going to move on to that other uh starting the other places to build and yeah right now the buy-in ultimately hopefully people that want to buy in are not just bringing money because I don't have a way to convert money into greenhouses, but I do have a way to convert some money and a lot of hands into greenhouses. We're not doing earth ships. This is very similar to earth ships, just so that I'm going to throw that word out there. Earth mm -hmm. ships. We're not doing earth ships, the labor intensive way where you fill a bunch of tires, which are going to leach chemicals into your air anyway. Like who, who wants to breathe tire? Um, yeah. But exactly. uh, we're not doing that. We're just, building 
as simple as possible without having to build kitchens and bathrooms, which are one of the bigger uh, hard to build things. We're building just the shell. As far as people might be worried about what they're gonna do with their poop and pee, we're gonna recycle it. That's what we're gonna do. It's gonna be part of our worship <laughs> as a church so that they can't give a shit about what we're doing if, the, if anyone wants to give us any trouble. Like, oh, you can't, you can't just compost that? Well, we can, because that's part of our religious <laughs> worship uh, ceremonies. We gotta, <laughs> we gotta give it back to the earth. That's, that's important, you know? <laughs> I'm being cheeky, but at the same time, like you got to get your freedom somehow. And um, ultimately, I think that it's not going to be a problem at all to uh, compost the the feces and the urine. There's going to be ways to make that useful. Oh, also, since we're building the vision of what this is going to be like, we're going to have uh, in one of the units in each little subcommunity. So out of the 192, there's going to be a whole lot of those. 30 plus that are that are community centers. They're not going to be owned by a specific place. But in some of those community centers, we will have artificial hot springs. So, yeah, hot mm. springs and artificial because um, if you have a pool, you got to keep it clean. If you have hot springs, you don't got to do anything. So we're going to build hot springs and a pool that takes care of itself in one of those greenhouses uh, so that so it's going to be indoors, but, but basically that's one hope I have so that it takes the place of your hot tub, you know, like so we're going to have a community hot tub called, called hot springs. And it's just going to be artificially created. And then I don't know what else we'll have. We'll probably have community centers for people to do work because I know a lot of people like woodworking and various types of hobbies, and they're not going to want to do that by themselves in their own greenhouse. Uh, sometimes they might want to do it in a more public place where all of their friends are also gathered around and they're in a larger area that doesn't have your RV there and your garden there. Cause you're going to need a garden. Um, my calculations before I started sizing these out was that a family of four could live on about a thousand square foot of gardening space. So I just overbuilt them so that you could have some indoor outdoor space with your RV. Your RV doesn't need to have windows. It's cool. It's a cool setup. You know, the people that are living the van life probably are like, well, that sounds pretty awesome. <laughs> and I say that not having lived the van life myself and not having lived in an RV very much myself, but I do like the idea of indoor outdoor living. And I like the idea of breathing, you know, forest air as opposed to chemtrail air. And, uh, that was one of the things that pushed me toward the greenhouse was the idea that like if you can't even control what air you get to breathe it's a problem yeah. because they're not being nice to us up there yes. if you look up if you look up and there's no guarantee even if we were nice to our own people how do you guarantee that someone in china didn't fart you know it's, it's happening we all share the same air and uh the plants do a good job at conditioning that air in terms of health to put uh, little particles of, I don't know, endorphins. I don't know what the right word is, but it's like the, the air becomes healthy when certain plants get to interact with that air. And uh, mm -hmm. that's a good thing. So maybe we should do that. Maybe we should be breathing air that we get to choose what plants are cleaning that air for us. And how do you do that if you don't live inside a greenhouse? That's it. That's my thinking. Yeah. And I haven't heard a good alternative, you know? Yeah. Well, again, man, it's, it's, I can so definitely tell, I can definitely tell you've, uh, you've put, let's put talk a lot price of thought into it. Second. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk price for a second. So since we're starting and I haven't built any greenhouses yet, I've just designed them and I have bought tractors and things so that we can start digging in the dirt, you know, but I haven't built anything yet. I don't have that many people. Um, on board yet because I haven't shared this far enough yet. But the plan is to start this way. People can choose to buy a piece of land and they will have full rights to the land forever. Like that's up, that's theirs, you know, no property taxes. You buy the land, great. But I, that's, that's available and I'm happy to sell the land on those terms. But you're going to be placed in part of the, uh, 
part of the land, the, the part geog geographically where other people did the same thing. So you're not going to have a whole lot of chance of that land becoming something where you find your best friends. You might just have that land and store stuff on it forever, you know, but that's one option. And you'll have the option to upgrade. So the next option is you buy land for basically, um, I think there's a discount here and it comes with water. So I'm going to provide 200 gallons per day because we're going to dig a well and send pipes to every piece of land. So you're going to get 200 gallons per day on this land. This is option two. And it's going to cost, I think, a little bit less. Um, so yeah, you're looking at like, it's going to be $10,000 per, per lot in 20, January of 2026. And it's going to increase 1% per month. And going backwards, we're at like $6,000 or $7,000 right now per piece of land. So you're going to be able to buy that land. Option one, you have it. No, you didn't give us an option to buy it back. Option two, you get it with some water and you give us in exchange the right to buy it back from you. So you kind of don't build anything permanent on there um, because we want to be able to convert it into an actual greenhouse one day. And then once we start building the greenhouses, then you'll be able to upgrade from whatever lot you're on. You'll be able to get take the credit from whatever you already spent on that lot plus 1% per year for having bought it earlier. And you'll be able to apply that credit toward upgrading to a, an actual climate controlled greenhouse that comes with water and the, the heat and cooling is basically set the temperature, set the thermostat. And those I'm targeting $30,000 each. So, and that is basically now you can retire on six months of labor or $30,000. That's the that's the target, and so, I mean, let's let that sink in. You could retire for thirty grand, and you don't even have to have thirty grand to do it. You just have to come out here and work and build the, like enough of your hours made enough to build three of these things. Then that turns out to you own one of them because you didn't pay for the land or the materials, but you worked enough to build three of them. You own one of them, and those are on the timeshare system where you get um, where you get paid the stake that's attached to that land, but you don't necessarily have a right to stay at that land without paying rent from your points, which oh my my battery died. Okay. Didn't die. I'm at twenty percent. So yeah, you you would own stake, which would produce points one percent per month, and you would spend those points to bid on auction style where you want to live and eventually you would be participating hopefully if you like the idea of meeting your best friends using the community match.com thing i know it's not match.com it's it's going to be better than answering a questionnaire or something we're going to have to find a way that it's that all you have to do is kind of just get online and say hey where can i move to but not answer any questions uh just because that's too hard to get everyone to do. But they could log on and say, hey, where's my discount apply? My discount applies in this place, this place, this place. Okay, cool. So now I'm gonna go there. Oh, also you own it in form of an NFT. You don't have to do any KYC who owns it. No, the NFT owns it. And uh, if you control the NFT, then you have rights to live there. So um, it's like a crypto wallet. Um, and there's no KYC because we don't care. I mean, we might care eventually. If it doesn't work, we're like, well, we need to get rid of all these criminals and crooks. Okay. But if this works, then all the criminals and crooks are going to live next to each other and they're going to have a wonderful time. So <laughs> there we talked price. Gotcha. Thank so, you. um, <laughs> yeah, no, no problem. No problem. You went, uh, okay. That's, uh, that's, um, yeah, that's great. So, um, you're get, you're getting close to building then, I guess, um, you've already got, you've already got the land. You've got, you've got the, the lots. Um, do you have a, a website or somewhere people can go to, to learn, to, to learn more? I think you mentioned, uh, you're in the uh, podcast might be in the works. Uh, how can people get involved and, and, uh, you know, uh, reach out. Okay. So what's happening is, can I share my screen? Yeah. So if people are watching this, then I'm going to share my screen and tell you, no, I'm going to answer your question first and then share my screen to explain why. The answer is you should probably go to 
Um, on my screen, I have WCDAO. That stands for We Church DAO. So t.me or whatever, We Church DAO, basically. t.me forward slash WCDAO is the Telegram group for this. I own some of the domain names, but I have not. Um, I have not built the websites yet. Um, I'm going to give a plug right now for top level domains, and it's called the Handshake Protocol and uh, Handshake Blockchain. And if you want a top level domain, which is like .com, .org, .net, you can write your own, and you can bid on it right now. Um, you can use namebase.io or there's some other methods that you can interact with the Handshake blockchain. Anyway, so my websites might not all be on the .org or the .com. They probably are just going to be on their own domain uh, in the future. So I'm bidding on a lot of the domains that I need, and they're super cheap by, right now. So anyone that's crypto-centric or web domain investor style, they're cheap, dude. They're extremely cheap. You can buy your own domain name. Top level domain. Where was I going? No website. Yes, Telegram channel. Go to that channel. It's not built out yet. Um, now I'm going to tell you what's going to be built there. Because I am, I do have a podcast in the works. And the delivery of that podcast is going to be like so. Let me share my screen. Well, let me actually first find the, find the diagram and then share my screen. Here's the diagram. Awesome. Okay, now I'm going to share screen. Okay, so I once, I once entered a sales funnel that was the most effective and engaging sales funnel I've ever uh, experienced. So better than click funnels. It was called 21 step system from Moby, M-O-B-E. They got in trouble. They had some very effective marketing. I did not buy their stuff, but I learned a lot from it. I, I went to one of their conferences. So what was effective about it was that after each time you would do an assignment, you were you were locked. You couldn't just binge watch your uh, education. You had to engage. You had to talk to someone. They called them a coach. They called it was a lady for me, but they they said it was a coach, and you would call in and you'd get free coaching between each lesson. And ultimately, that coach did a good job for the first three or four steps, the three, first three or four lessons, and then they started to like. Uh, if you weren't going to spend $20,000, then they started to kind of like blow you off. But until they changed their tune, it was amazing in terms of how the, ex the user experience and the engagement factor. So my podcast will not be delivered on a regular podcast um, content delivery system. It's going to be on my own content delivery system that you guys are free to use if you want to put together classes or lessons like this. And so here you go. Let's say you, there, there's a you there and there's a you here. So you might not know anyone, this is unlikely, that has a free course. Most likely you're gonna get a link for someone's free course. But if you don't, then you enter at the entrance. So from the entrance, it's accessible from anyone, the clubhouse, I've used uh, disc golf terms here and golf terms. I've kind of mixed them, but ultimately it's like different rooms that have lessons in them, like video lessons, okay? So the entrance is accessible by anyone. The clubhouse is accessible through the entrance by sharing, oh, I named the place Give Loud. Um, that's the name of this platform for sharing your content. Mm. Uh, by sharing Give Loud on social media, minimum of 10 likes or comments, because you can't just share. Sometimes sharing is useless. Um, or they can pay $5 to pass into the clubhouse. From the clubhouse, they're going to see all of the free lessons and be able to inter interact with those free lessons. So basically, you can get to those by paying or doing something with your time and your reputation to get yourself into the clubhouse. 
from the course completion area, the clubhouse is accessible for free. So you can enter by the entrance, the front door, or the side door. The side door is like after you complete a course, then you can either do some paid courses from that um, same person that, that gives courses, course creator, or you can go back to the clubhouse and find another free course that you're interested in. So we're, we will have different courses here, um, but my podcast is going to be on here as well. And what it's going to do is my, my podcast is going to be a free course accessible from the clubhouse. Once you open the first lesson and you commit to taking this course, you cannot jump around. You can't go into another course. You can't go to the middle lesson or whatever. You have to follow the, the format. So you start on that lesson one. Let's, let, let's read this. But yeah, then after each lesson, you have to call in and talk to someone. So you're going to talk to someone. Initially, it's going to be me. You're going to put your name on my calendar. You're going to call in. And we're going to talk about the lesson that you just listen to and what you learned and what I should change, give me feedback, whatever. And then you're going to, I'm going to unlock lesson two for you and you're going to be able to see the next lesson. So basically that's what was engaging about that um, funnel. It was extremely engaging because you couldn't go anywhere without talking to someone after each lesson. And it really freaking worked. And what it, the benefits to the provider, the creator of the course, is they actually get to know their customers. They actually get to know these people. And some of the people that they get to know that finally make it through the complete to complete the course, some of those people are going to be like pretty good candidates for answering the phones as well. So they're going to kind of hire those people and or just allow them to answer the phones, basically. So then there's going to be more than one person that you can schedule a call with. But let's, uh, okay. All right, so this clubhouse only has two free courses in it, and this is just a diagram. My free course is there. The entrance exists in Telegram. It's just a Telegram group. The clubhouse exists in Telegram. The free course, my free course exists, and the first lesson is there. So I have not built the rest of the lessons. I haven't finished my podcast. My podcast is going to have an like an intro series that's free. And then I'm going to have content that's paid content. Um, and when I say pay, I don't mean you have to have money to do it. I just mean that you have to do something to get through. So you're either going to pay $5 if that's easier on your uh, situation to pay $5, then you're going to pay $5 because you don't want to share on social media or you're going to share on social media. So one or the other gets you into the next lesson. If you are one of the people that answers the phones, because I like you and I'm like, yeah, you could answer people's questions and do, do the little feedback call in when they pass each lesson, then I would give you credits as well. So you'd be able to take my free courses and I'll probably coordinate with other providers so that they'll, you know, take credits from me and, you know, back and forth, but that's not guaranteed. So where can they find me? Go to the We Church DAO, WCDAO on Telegram. And that is not the free course start, but I'm probably going to make it the free course starting point. Um, oh, so the benefit for the providers, I say, I'm saying provider, that's okay. Um, the course creator is that once they share their link, then their customers jump straight to their free course. They don't go to the entrance. They go straight to the free course and they're locked in. So in order to get out of a free course, if you're like midway through it and you're not liking it, then you can either like delete your account or whatever, or you can just jump ship mid, mid course, but then you go back to the entrance instead of the clubhouse. So there's an incentive to actually finishing your course. And once you get to the course completion, then you don't got to pay $5 to get into the clubhouse. And you unlock the ability to do paid courses because your, um, providers, all the providers do are not allowed to put paid courses in the clubhouse. They only put paid courses in the next room after, you know, from the course completion room. And the reason I'm doing that is because I have the intro podcast. I'm hoping that basically 80% of the people that join or participate, 80% of the people that get wallets, you know, in the, in the DAO will go through this 
uh, knowledge and they'll, they'll understand mm, the things that I think are most important for them to understand about the system. And then I have other stuff that's just interesting. And because of that, I'm like, not everyone has to know it, but some people that are interested will want to know it. So that's why I'm putting that as a separate, separate class, like world views is going to be one of them because I have, there's different models for me. Uh, I, there's different models of the universe and like the relationships that we have to God and stuff like that. Um, one of them is like the dream model where this whole existence is just a dream in God's head and God wakes up this, you know, this all ends and our awareness isn't necessarily ours. It's kind of like God's. So we wake up with him. We don't die and go to hell or whatever. Hell doesn't exist in that model. It exists as a concept, but not as anything of substance, because even this world is not of substance in that model. But yeah, I have multiple worldview models, and I think people would be interested in hearing them, and I'll probably make them out into a paid course scenario where they can either share on social media or um, pay $5 to unlock the lesson. Gotcha. Okay. So what's engaging about it is it keeps them on track. Yeah. Let's read the rest of these notes real quick. Three courses will pre be presented with an outline and an estimated time to complete the course broken down into baskets. I say baskets because Frisbee golf, you know, but it's a lesson. It's a lesson. And you can put in the lesson um, like a part two or a part three, you know, would include part two includes two items like a video and then the call in part three might include um, a video and a call in and maybe something you have to read. Um, the course creator just gets to choose what they want you to do in each uh, lesson. What else have I have I not read here? I think I read the clubhouse is where you can access all the free courses. Let's see if I missed anything. Completed course area. From the completed free course, you can access pay courses. Otherwise, you can't access them. You have to complete their free course, the creator's free course, in order to get to this play, this point and take their paid courses. From this area, you can revisit the baskets from within the, the free course for review, um, and you wouldn't have to call in. You'd be able to, from the course completed area, you can go back and like rewatch some of those videos. Um, that doesn't necessarily apply to paid courses, but it does for all the free courses. To get here from the clubhouse, you can click on the course, and it will remember that you already completed the course and bring you to the completed course room. Pay course. Pay courses will have a course outline showing the time required to complete the course and the cost of each basket to be paid via credits, money, or sharing on social media. So yeah, I'm a proponent of people not having to have money because I don't want a world where I need money anymore. I'm trying to build one where I don't. So let me uh, unshare my screen and see if you have any questions. But yeah, that's where they should go to find me. And I will have a course where they can go through and listen to my podcast and kind of chat with me or one of my team to discuss it. It's more like a five to 15 minute call after each lesson, but there might be homework. There might not. I don't know. It's just going to be an interesting way of, of putting the blinders on like the horse blinders and say, Hey, you got to stay focused. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting, man. Very interesting. Well, I will definitely make sure to put a link to uh, your telegram uh, in the show notes and that will be, um, oh gosh, I don't even know what episode. Let me check. I'll let people know where the show notes will be. Um, you know what epi what number episode it is. But then again, my numbering system is bad now. Um, so it'll be uh, 171, suvanipodcast.com forward slash 171 uh, will be where uh, all all uh, his links will be. Um, I guess uh, um, one other comment here that I just uh, I thought of a little bit ago when you were talking about, uh, um, you know, you're getting pretty close to building. Well, um, we just started putting together the Paznia map um, and Second Realm directory. So um, we will uh, we might have to if you're interested, uh, we can put your uh, properties on the vetted, you know, vetted directory at some point. Um, and uh, hopefully there's some venue. I know there's some venue yeah. and some people have reached out to me um, in the past year or two looking for opportunities like this. So um, I'm hoping you'll hear you'll you'll uh, hear from, a, you know, a person or two from my audience, too. That'd be a be pretty sweet. So, um, and definitely yeah, not I unlikely. hope we find some buyers and yeah, I hope we find buyers and we find people that are also wanting to come live out here. Cause even if they just live out here and it's not built yet, there's a chance they're going to help me build it. <laughs> wink, wink, nod, nod. <laughs> like, Hey, come hold up this board or whatever. So, uh, 
it'll be good. The more people we have, um, and we're located in the first one's here near Beaver, Utah. Um, it's seven minutes from Beaver, and that's where I'm hoping that we all get started, and then we'll build other ones, and then, and then the DAO will accept builds from all over the world. Um, it's gonna, they're gonna build it, whoever builds it to whatever specs we um, open source and say, hey, this works in this climate, so maybe build it like that. Then they're going to petition the DAO to accept their built uh, properties onto the DAO, and then we're going to buy it from them with minted stake. We just create it out of thin air and attach it to that value, um, that asset value, and then they're going to get the benefit of that stake. And the stake is the amount of time it should take to build it. So. Uh, if you build slow, you're not going to earn as much per hour. If you build really fast, you're going to earn more per hour because we're going to assess the value of what's actually been built based on what it should take to build it in whatever whatever actuarial tables we have as a group as we build um, as a DAO, you know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, yeah, I would love to sell some of these things to people that are interested in helping. It's cool. It's going to work. It's going to happen. It's just more people make it happen faster. Yeah, so, that's all. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Thank you. Well, uh, um, well, yeah, it was amazing to uh, to have you on and uh, to chat, Rex. Um, definitely great. I'm looking forward to. Uh, we we covered a lot of ground here in a couple hours, um, and uh, we, I mean, we we uh, didn't really go too far into um, into you know very many avenues. Kind of just kind of brushed the surface. So um, we'll have to get you back on uh, again, as we talked about in the beginning. Um, but uh, I guess uh, until then, any other uh, closing thoughts before uh, before we reconvene? I just say, uh, make free yourself. I'd say free yourself to um, all these people because I know that once people are free, they're going to be looking for other people that are not only free but are cool. So, cool. I know that's an old term, but like people that they like that are really um, good to hang out with, good people, um, your soul tribe, whatever. So, free yourself. And then once you're free, I can see that you're going to be. I'm pretty sure you're going to come join my project. Why, well, why else would I spend five years meditating on how this was supposed to work if if someone else was going to build a better thing? Like, that's fine. In fact, I hope they do, but they would kind of waste my time. That's all right. <laughs> I'll join. I'm I'm open to a better solution, but I do think this is a good solution, and uh, it also allows people that want to just get free, and it gives them a path to do that without having to learn all the laws, without having to invest a lot of time into anything other than uh, participate a little bit in a protection union, do your do what you can, but know that the protection union is going to have a lot more skilled people that can do the harder stuff if you do get yourself in an extra hard pickle, you know, and uh, also freeing yourself financially because you don't even have to have money to do this, guys. You just come out here and we build this and then you don't need money after that either because we just we put together everything you need and you're retired uh, for like 30 grand plus an rv if you don't have an rv live in a tent it's not going to rain on you and it's not going to freeze you out so <laughs> those are my final thoughts <laughs> i awesome. appreciate you all and i would love to be back yeah yeah yeah, well, uh, um, yeah, it's 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 been uh, yeah great to connect, and I'm I'm always happy to see projects like this, especially ones you know I'm always good happy to hear about projects like this, but especially ones that are, um, you know that are you know that are happening. So, um, that's it's uh, definitely definitely incredible. I'm looking forward to to following along and and seeing how it's uh, seeing how it all pans out, and uh, you know uh, having uh, some Pasnians and and Venuans, uh, you know, hopefully uh, get involved as well. So. Um, yeah, with that said, guys, uh, we'll go ahead and close it out. There it has been about over two hours, and it's about time to dinner time here at Veritas. But, uh, um, yeah, thanks again to Rex for coming on. Thank you guys for tuning in. And, uh, yeah, Paznia.com um, for all things The Free Republic and VaniaPodcast.com for all things Vanu. Um, so, yeah, until next time, guys, uh, always remember, Vanu is yours for the making, and the second realm is yours for the building. Cheers. Mom, are all countries coercive shitholes? Most are, yes, but have you heard of the Free Republic of Poznia? No, what's Poznia? Poznia is the first free country in existence, right now, founded upon truth, peace, and voluntarism, rather than coercion, as you pointed out. POS itself is an acronym for the freedom strategy of building permanent autonomous zones, places in which we can be free and exercise our autonomy without the threat of force. Oh, cool, so a free country exists. Where is it? 
Well, unlike the traditional statist country structure, Poznia is a decentralized, geographically independent country. So, in essence, it's everywhere. How do we visit or join? Good question. Poznia is a vetted network, so not everyone is welcome. Reputation must be verified and the use of coercion forsworn. But soon, a directory and map, both public-facing and private, will be available at Poznia.com. And for now, gatherings of liberation in the Second Realm are already happening at Veritas, Poznia, Roots, Poznia, and Fox Prairie, Poznia, to name a few. Those interested in joining this Poznia Second Realm network can become founding or honorary stakeholders. In addition to gaining access to discounts and specials at Veritas, and the wider network, other perks exist, such as passports, stakeholder dinners at the consulate, access to healing technologies at the Department of Health, Wellness, special Poznia silver coins, and more. And for those who want to get involved but in a more distant manner, there's also the Poznia Committee of Correspondence Telegram Chat, the Poznia Seed Exchange, and much, much more in store. Grandma would love this. What's the website again? I want to tell her about it. Ha ha ha. That's funny. Grandma's been a stakeholder for longer than you've been alive. But if you wanted to tell your Uncle Mike, the website is Poznia.com. And linked right at the top of the page is the 2021-2022 Stakeholder Bulletin. There, he can find a more thorough and wordy explanation of the Second Realm Network currently under construction. You could even invite him to Vanufest 3, a now annual, week-long gathering of liberation at Veritas. This year, it's from September 26 to October 3rd. Sounds like a blast! Posnia.com. Okay, thanks mom, anything else I need to know? One thing, dear. Always remember, Vanu is yours for the making and the second realm is yours for the building. See you in the second realm. The intent of the Ghostpad is to offer a complete security and privacy hardened computer system that is built from the ground up to be an effective direct action countermeasure for those who want to actively resist the privacy intrusions of the, the entire surveillance state Hydra, both public sector and private sector. A user-friendly computer that the owner maintains exclusive control over every aspect of its operation and has complete control over who accesses what data. A ghost pad is your virtual corner of the room where the cameras, microphones, and other data collection devices have no power. After all, power comes from ownership, which is exclusive control. Unlike practically any other available option, when you buy a ghost pad you are truly its owner. And while the masses beg and bleed to their political corporate masters to loosen their chains, ghost pad owners can use their systems as virtual bolt cutters and cut themselves free. Ghost pads are high-quality business rugged laptops that have had the security compromising system firmware, BIOS firmware, Intel management engine, etc., removed and replaced with more secure, free and open-source alternatives. The closed-source binary BIOS firmware has been removed from the system board and replaced with free, as in freedom, alternatives as well as the Intel management engine also being neutralized. That combination makes them more secure by design, and preemptively thwarts any attempts by threat actors, both public and private, to gain access by exploiting its vulnerabilities, either by an engineered in and hidden backdoor, or a zero-day exploit in the factory, supplied firmware or the Intel management engine. Perhaps the most important security privacy enhancing feature these systems have, is the neutralizing of the aforementioned Intel management engine, I'm. The IM is a separate computer and a computer that is embedded into all Intel platforms made since 2008. It has its own operating system called Minix. It operates out of band meaning that your primary CPU has no access to monitor what it is doing, and it has direct access to all the hardware that your primary CPU does, making it the ultimate embedded spying device. If you can't audit what it's doing, it's always on when the computer is plugged in, or has battery power, it has its own network interface with its own MAC address that can bypass any system firewall configuration, it has its own storage you have no access to, it can access your microphone, camera, keyboard, can record keystrokes, and display, can screenshot your encrypted communications, while you are reading and writing them. 
the IM can only be disabled by modifying the system's firmware. That can only be accomplished by using an external programmer to reprogram the chip that stores the system's firmware. Only select laptop models can be modified. We concentrate on the compatible models with the highest performance available. We offer models that are 2x as powerful as any configuration sold and supported by Lenovo. Transitioning your computing activity to privacy-hardened platforms is a direct action strategy to resist the attempts at total omnipresence by the surveillance state. To put it simply, these systems are some of the few available that are likely compromised in some way on the firmware level, so they are some of the most secure and private available for use cases where the those attributes are the most important. It is also why systems configured this way are considered as ideal to use as a base to install a security privacy hardened OS, such as Cubes OS, Parrot OS, or other privacy focused Linux distributions, on. To view the full selection of ghost pads, ghost phones, and other privacy tools available via Liberty under attack publications, just visit libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. What are you waiting for? Step up your security culture today. Again, libertinderattack.com forward slash privacy tools. Liberty under attack publications, share your story, find your freedom.